So without further ado, let's bring out Keith Lloyd. And there is Keith. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Keith Warren Lloyd, and uh, I'm going to be presenting uh, some information uh, that uh, about a historical event that took place uh, in and around the city of Scottsdale uh, in the 1940s during the Second World War. Uh, most people are familiar with Papago Park. Uh, it's about a thousand acres of, uh, of land that's been set aside. Uh, it, it's uh, actually a city of Phoenix Park with borders with the, uh, the city of Scottsdale. Most people know about the, uh, the hiking trails and the, uh, the iconic uh, Papago Buttes and the softball fields. But what a lot of people don't know is that uh, in the 1940s, uh, Papago Park was a location of a prisoner of war camp. Of course, um, as we're all, you know, I'm sure we're all aware, uh, I don't, I don't want to get too, uh, too deep into, uh, into the history of it, but um, I'll, I'll assume that everybody knows what happened. Um, of course, uh, uh, Nazi Germany under Adolf Hitler swept through uh, Europe uh, in 1939, 1940. On December 7th, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Uh, America was plunged into the Second World War. Three days later, uh, Adolf Hitler, Nazi Germany, declared war on the United States. Uh, in describing the next couple of, uh, of slides and really kind of getting into the detail of what, uh, of how this works in with Papago Park. I'm going to just, I'm going to read a little excerpt from my book because I really can't describe it any better than the way I wrote it. So following the Pearl Harbor attack, the American populace quickly shook off their shock and horror and set to work. Shivering in their overcoats against the December wind, thousands of young men waited outside recruiting stations in lines that would stretch for several city blocks. It would be a near total mobilization. 16 million would eventually serve in uniform, forming the largest military force in the history of the world. Millions more would take jobs in defense plants, including 5 million women, many of whom were joining the workforce for the first time in their lives. Unemployment, which had peaked at 25% at the height of the Great Depression, would plunge to less than 1% by 1944. Guarded by two immense oceans and safely out of range, of enemy air forces, the industrial base of the United States was soon converted into an arsenal of democracy. Before it was over, the United States would spend more than $300 billion on war production, a sum that is in excess of $3 trillion today. Factories that once turned out Maytag washing machines began making parts for Army Air Corps bombers. The AC spark plug and frigid air companies assembled machine guns. Firestone not only produced millions of Jeep tires, but also built anti-aircraft guns. Civilian automobile production had all but ceased, the big three of Detroit turning out thousands of military vehicles, weapons, and airplanes. Chrysler cranked out thousands of Sherman tanks. Gen uh, General Motors produced everything from army trucks and aircraft engines to amphibious landing craft and torpedoes. Ford's mile-long aircraft plant in Willow Run, Michigan produced a B-24 Liberator every 63 minutes. The numbers were staggering. 280,000 aircraft, 85,000 tanks, 3 million trucks and Jeeps, nearly 9,000 warships, 5 million M1 rifles, 41 billion rounds of ammunition. Seemingly endless supplies of raw materials were mined and processed, over 6 billion barrels of crude oil, 2 million tons of coal, and 368 million tons of steel. A good measure of these critical resources was being shipped to Great Britain and to Russia, whose populations also needed to be fed. American farmers scrambled to produce more food. 15 million tons of wheat were harvested every year of the war. Half of all U.S. milk uh, dairy production was sent overseas. The Hormel Company produced 105 million hogs, sorry, processed 105 million hogs to produce over 3 billion cans of a GI ration that would soon become infamous, spam. Moving this vast amount of material and machines along with several million troops to combat theaters around the globe 
would require a huge fleet of merchant ships. 18 different shipbuilding companies produced 2,700 Liberty cargo ships during the war. Eventually, they would shave the average construction time of a 14,000 ton Liberty ship down to 42 days. Arrayed against this mighty force were a handful of young German sailors and their submarines in whom the Third Reich had placed all of its faith. And so at any given time, uh, there were uh, at least 70 German submarines, U-boats, that were in operation in the Atlantic. In uh, early 1941, sorry, early 1942, January of 1942, uh, the Admiral, who I just had in the previous slide, Admiral Dunitz, who was in charge of the German U-boat force, uh, launched an, a, a U-boat offensive against the American Eastern Seaboard. It was called Operation Drumbeat. 25 ships were sunk in the first month. The uh, Germans referred to it as uh, one of their quote unquote happy times. Uh, and they also referred to it as the American shooting season. So there, were, uh, there was a U-boat offensive against the United States, uh, sh uh, ships that were uh, in convoys uh, heading across the Atlantic uh, were the target of the German U-boat force. In November of 1942, the United States launched Operation Torch, which was the invasion of North Africa. Uh, eventually, with the defeat of uh, General Rommel's Africa Corps, uh, there were thousands of prisoners of war that were uh, rounded up, and uh, the United States agreed to house them. The, the British did not have the, uh, the land or the resources in order to house and feed uh, German prisoners of war. And so uh, America agreed to house them. Most people don't realize that we had POWs here in the United States. Uh, every state except for Vermont had a POW camp. And uh, as I said, most people don't even realize that. My parents remember uh, in their, their travels across the country, remember seeing, remember seeing POW camps. A lot of people tell me that they didn't even realize that they were being held in the United States. But there were some 400,000 uh, prisoners of war that were held in the United States. In uh, 1943, uh, after the United States had been at war for uh, about a year, uh, there were several uh, new anti-submarine platforms that were, that were launched. Uh, we started producing more and more destroyers, destroyer escorts to escort the convoys. Uh, we started using uh, the, the picture at the bottom of the screen there, that's the USS Bogue, is a, a escort carrier, or uh, also known as a Jeep carrier. And uh, they would have uh, fighters and bombers that would uh, provide air cover for the, for the uh, convoys. And uh, they formed what were known as uh, hunter-killer groups, where they went after U-boats for the sole purpose of going after U-boats and destroying them. There were different uh, anti-submarine weapons and technologies that were produced. Uh, the British produced uh, what, was, what they called ASDIC, what we, we know it as sonar. Uh, there were uh, hedgehog mortars, uh, new and improved uh, depth charges. So uh, pretty soon, uh, the hunters became the hunted. Uh, these are photographs that were taken of several uh, German submarines that were uh, destroyed by uh, American aircraft that were covering the convoys. Um, you got to remember, uh, the submarines were, were diesel electric submarines. They couldn't travel underwater the entire time. Uh, so they had diesel motors that ran uh, while they were on the surface. And while, they were, while the diesel motors were running, they charged banks of batteries. And the submarines, when they submerged, they ran off of battery power. And so they couldn't stay submerged for very long. Uh, they did not have uh, the speed to keep up with the convoy in order to intercept a convoy if they were underwater uh, running on electric motors. And they also couldn't see. Uh, uh, the periscope gives you a very limited view, and they also couldn't see the convoys that they were targeting unless they were on the surface. So they actually spent quite a bit of time on the surface, and often they were caught on the surface by uh, American uh, aircraft and uh, escorts. Pretty soon, uh, 
U boat, uh, we were collecting U boat members that were uh, that survived the the uh, the counterattacks against their their U boats and U boats that were sunk. Uh, the the, uh, the crew members were taken prisoner. Their first stop was this location. It's uh, Fort Hunt, Virginia, which is right across the Potomac River from Washington D.C. And uh, at Fort Hunt, that is where they were interrogated by a Joint Army and Navy interrogation team. They were German-speaking American officers that would do lengthy interrogations uh, with uh, the U-boat crews before they were sent on to a regular prisoner of war camp. In mid-1943, the decision was made by the uh, United States Army Office of the Provost Marshal, uh, which was uh, in the entity in charge of um, guarding prisoners of war, they decided to create a prisoner of war camp at Papago Park. Papago Park had been the, the site of a uh, civilian conservation corps camp during the depression. And uh, after that, the National Guard used it. Uh, the National Guard still uses Papago Park today. There's a military facility that's there now. But uh, in 1943, they decided it would be a good location for uh, housing German naval prisoners. You can imagine it, it, it took them out of their element completely. Uh, they were seagoing uh, men and they, they were dropped in the middle of a very unfamiliar and harsh uh, Arizona desert. The first German prisoners uh, arrived uh, in January of 1944. And what they found was approximately uh, between 150 and 200 acres of desert land that had been uh, uh, where huts had been built. Uh, there were uh, barracks that were built in place. There was a hospital on the grounds. You can see that the, on the picture there, you can see the, uh, to the left, you can see the, the smokestack, which uh, was their power plant. Um, you can see the fence line uh, going around the stockade also. Um, this location was uh, basically today would be 64th Street and Thomas, right on the, on the uh, south west corner of 64th Street and, and Thomas. I'm sorry, 64th Street and Oak, I apologize. So uh, on the north side of Oak, you can see, um, you can, uh, today you can see the Officers Club is there. It's now the Elks Lodge. That's the only building that's, that's really left. And uh, the bulk of the, uh, of the property uh, to the south there where the, where the softball fields are today was the location of the, of the uh, camp. 64th Street uh, running south from Thomas uh, was the, the driveway into the camp. Uh, it, uh, McDowell Road did not go through that far to the east at the time. And uh, so their access was off of Thomas Road and then they drove south on what is today 64th Street. On the uh, east side of the camp, it was bordered by the uh, Arizona Crosscut Canal. And uh, that figures prominently into our story. So you can see the Crosscut Canal at the top of the map there, and this is pretty much the layout of the, uh, of the camp and the different compounds. The upper left compound is compound number one, and uh, that is going to figure prominently in our story also. It wasn't long uh, after the Germans arrived in uh, January of 1944 that they started having uh, problems at the uh, prisoner of war camp. Uh, in the month of February, uh, there were nine Germans that escaped, five of them at one time. Uh, five of them were uh, German submarine captains that, that escaped. They were all recaptured. Uh, two of them were captured uh, down in Tucson uh, by the Tucson police. And uh, Tucson police called Papago Park and he said, we captured two of your, pris two of your prisoners. And Papago Park wasn't even aware that they had escaped. So obviously uh, something was wrong there with the administration. There were the, the colonel that was in charge uh, was uh, investigated by the army. Here's a copy of the report. Uh, there was a, a captain by the name of D.L. Schweiger. He was a, a, a captain with uh, the military police and he was sent to Papago Park uh, by the provost marshal's office to figure out what was going on. Uh, the camp commander, Colonel Means, did not receive him very well. He seemed like uh, fairly annoyed that he was being investigated. 
uh, if you read through the report, it's, it's uh, not very complimentary. And uh, at one point, Captain Schweiger states that the uh, camp was being run with extreme laxity, that uh, there were uh, ID checks were not being performed uh, the way they should have. There were uh, prisoners allowed to mill about through different compounds. Gates were missing or unlocked. Uh, so it was run very lackadaisically. And, and uh, eight days after Captain Schweiger departed, and, and filed his report with the army, this young man was found hanging in one of the shower rooms at the camp. Uh, his name was Werner Dreschler, and uh, he was a crew member aboard a German U-boat. He had been captured, and when he was at Fort Hunt, Virginia, he uh, cooperated with the German, I'm sorry, with the American uh, uh, officer, intelligence officers, that were interrogating German prisoners. He agreed to pose under an assumed name and, uh, and talk to uh, different German prisoners while they were being recorded and tried to get information out of, out of them. Uh, apparently he wasn't very good at that. He wasn't uh, very subtle. And uh, the German prisoners that he interrogated figured out pretty quickly that he was a spy. And he was not supposed to be sent to a prisoner of war camp uh, where German naval prisoners are being held. But the army, uh, as, as they said in the parlance of the day, there was a snafu and they end up sending him to Papago Park. And he didn't last a day. Uh, they ended up beating him and hanging him in, in the shower room. And so it was only eight days after, after uh, Captain Schweiger filed his report saying the camp was run with extreme laxity. So Colonel Means was relieved of his command. There was an interim commander by the name of Barber who uh, took over for, a, for a, a, a few weeks. And then he was ultimately replaced by this gentleman, uh, Colonel William Holden, no relation to the actor. Um, Captain Holden, I'm sorry, Colonel Holden had been a, uh, uh, he was a World War I veteran. He was a company commander in the 1st Infantry Division uh, in uh, the First World War. He had been wounded in action. Uh, uh, he had, uh, was awarded the Silver Star, was awarded the uh, Purple Heart, and uh, he was, uh, had a very sterling reputation. However, he had a, a heart condition, and so he was not allowed to accompany uh, his unit overseas. He was instead uh, sent to go work with uh, the Army Service Forces, and he opened up uh, a prisoner of war camp in uh, Florence, which housed Italian uh, POWs. And uh, it was a thought of as a model prison camp. And uh, he was assigned to Papago Park because of all the problems that were there. He was, he was going there to basically to fix Papago Park. He had a long list of problems to deal with. The camp was uh, needed to be policed up. It needed to be clean. The drainage needed to be uh, per, uh, put in place. Uh, huts needed to be mended, uh, work programs needed to be uh, put in place also for the, for the prisoners because they were, they were quite idle. Uh, he had some troublemakers to deal with. This is a, a group photograph of some of the prisoners at Papago Park and several of these gentlemen escaped. Some of them escaped multiple times. You can see the, uh, uh, the McDowell Mountains of Scottsdale in the background there. These are some of the prisoner huts. Uh, note the garden plots that are around the, uh, that are around the barracks buildings. Uh, the prisoners put those in, and that figures, out, all, figures into our, our story also. Anyway, the camp needed to be cleaned up, needed to be reorganized. Uh, I mentioned the work programs. Uh, bef before the war, 16%, I'm sorry, 16% of the population at the time of the American population worked in agriculture. Only 2% works in agriculture today. Um, when young men that worked on farms went and joined the military or they were drafted into the military, uh, American farmers were left without their workforce. And so there were several programs that were put in place to help farmers harvest their crops. Uh, there was the Women's Land Army which uh, recruited high school girls to uh, 
to uh, harvest crops. There was a, a what was known as the Brocaro program, where uh, uh, immigrants from Mexico were brought up under under work permits, work visas, and they were allowed to uh, to work on farms and harvest crops. Eventually, the uh, Provost Marshal's office put in place a program to to use uh, prisoners of war. Uh, for, for this purpose. That was allowed under the Geneva Convention as long as they were paid. They had to be paid the uh, same amount uh, of a private in the United States Army, and which at the time was 80 cents a day. And that's what they were, that's what they were paid to harvest crops. Uh, they harvested, uh, German prisoners of war harvested uh, potatoes in Queen Creek. They harvested cotton in Chandler. Uh, and they, they sacked uh, cantaloupe in Yuma. They went all over, all over the valley and all over the state um, seasonally. There were uh, branch camps that were put in place uh, for them to, to uh, harvest crops. So that was, uh, that was one of the concerns of uh, Colonel Holden when he arrived there is that he had to put all those programs in place that hadn't, had not yet been done. Um, and he had to do something with uh, with the German prisoners that were uh, known as political agitators. Uh, there were some of them that were hardcore Nazis. Um, and there were, there were a lot, there's a lot of revisionist history out there where people say, well, there weren't, there were not, you know, the, the sailors on the U-boats weren't Nazis or, the, or they were professional naval officers that were not Nazis. That's not true. Um, there were several of them that were hardcore, hardcore Nazis. And uh, most of the troublemakers, the ones that that uh, refused to, to work or uh, did work slowdowns and they did everything they could to make the, the American administration of the POW camps difficult. Most of them were uh, rounded up and placed into, um, into their own compound, which turned out to not be such a great idea. Top of the troublemaker list was this gentleman here, uh, the senior POW officer at the camp. His name was Jürgen Wattenberg. Jürgen Wattenberg came uh, from uh, Lübeck, Germany. He uh, went, attended the Ploner Academy. He was uh, in the surface fleet of the German Navy. Um, in 1939, he was the navigation officer aboard the Graf Spee, which was a 16,000 ton pocket battleship. Um, it was involved in the first naval battle of the war off the coast of Uruguay, uh, the Battle of River, the River Plate. Um, after the, the battle, the, uh, the Graf Spee damaged, uh, went into Montevideo, the harbor at Montevideo, and uh, the, um, the captain of the ship uh, scuttled the ship, uh, went ashore with his crew, and uh, shot himself. There's a photograph taken from his funeral uh, in Buenos Aires. Uh, note the civilians in the background giving the Nazi salute. There were a lot of Germans, German immigrants in, in Argentina and a lot of Nazi sympathizers in Argentina. And again, that figures into the story. Jürgen Wattenberg is the gentleman at the head of the column to the right. After, um, after his captain's funeral, he decided he was not willing to be interned in uh, in Argentina, and he embarked upon a uh, an escape. Uh, he went um, first to Chile, and then a, a circuitous, circuitous route. Uh, ended up uh, catching a, a flight, an Italian flight to Spain, and uh, worked his way uh, back to Germany. And uh, he was given command of the U-162. He uh, initially he was Initially, he was assigned to Operation Sea Lion, which was going to be the invasion of, uh, of Britain as, the, uh, as a communications officer. And when that fell through and, they just, and the Germans decided not to invade, German, uh, not to invade Britain, uh, Jürgen Wattenberg requested a transfer to submarine school, and then he was given command of the U-162. Uh, this is a, a picture of the actual U-162 take uh, when it was refueling at sea. Uh, it was a Type 9 long-range U-boat. Uh, he went all the way to the Caribbean on a couple of different patrols. On his third patrol, here's a picture of him with a, a pig that uh, actually swam away from a, sink, a ship that they sank and uh, became their, their crew's mascot. Um, 
On the third patrol, they ran afoul of three British destroyers, the Pathfinder, the Vimy, and the Quinton. And uh, they were attacked by the uh, British destroyers and, they were, and uh, depth charged. Their submarine was damaged and uh, was forced to surface. The situation was hopeless and uh, they surrendered. So Jürgen Wattenberg and the balance of his crew were sent, uh, those that survived, uh, were sent to Fort Hunt, Virginia for interrogation. Jürgen Wattenberg was a hardcore Nazi and uh, he didn't bend to any interrogation at all, gave them little to no information. He was sent, uh, after a short period of time, he was sent to Tennessee, Crossville, Tennessee, to a prisoner of war camp there. And uh, then when they opened the prisoner of war camp in Papago Park, he was sent there as the uh, senior officer. There were some other troublemakers that were, that were uh, at Papago Park. There was uh, Hans Werner Krauss, he was the commander of the U-199. Uh, Fritz Guggenberger, uh, who's commander of the U-513. He, uh, was, the, he was a hero in the, the, the U-boat uh, community. He was man responsible for sinking the uh, carrier HMS Ark Royal. Uh, he received the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, so uh, the German equivalent of a Medal of Honor. So he was a, uh, a highly decorated officer. And he had also, he was one of the gentlemen that escaped and, and was recaptured in February of 1944. Here's some mug shots of a couple other ones. Uh, Jürgen Quiet Faslim, he was, he figured, and he was part of the, uh, the plot, uh, the escape plot that we'll talk about. Johann Kramer, he was uh, uh, a gentleman who was on uh, Jürgen Wattenberg's crew, and he also escaped. And then there's uh, Guggenberger again. Colonel Holden put them here, uh, compound one which was on the uh, north east corner of the Papago Park prisoner of war camp. And you can see the uh, Arizona Crosscut Canal border them to the east. So the, this map is oriented where the, the top of the map is east, to the left is north, just so you know. So uh, he put them in compound one, uh, the officers into compound 1A, the enlisted men into compound 1B, those that were, that were uh, quote unquote, troublemakers, political, political agitators, and the like. Um, basically what he ended up doing, what, what Colonel Holden inadvertently ended up doing was he took uh, a group of highly intelligent, highly trained, highly motivated professionals with an array of technical skills and he locked them into a pen with nothing to do. And, uh, that did not end well for him. In September of 1944, uh, one of the prisoners in compound 1A discovered that there was a blind spot. There was a blind spot. If you look at the, at the uh, there's the graphic, the second graphic down where it says bathhouse. If you look there, uh, there was a bathhouse building T508 and, to the, and just to the south of it, was a coal box. It was a coal-fired uh, bathhouse. Um, and so there was a coal box that was there uh, next to it where they, they stored the coal for the coal-fired furnace that, that heated the water in the bathhouse. Prisoners discovered that, that the guard towers that were arrayed around the compound could not see uh, between the bathhouse and the coal box. There was a blind spot that was there. Um, they dis the prisoners discovered it fairly quickly. And in September of 1944, they decided to dig a tunnel and to escape. Uh, the American administration, uh, there was uh, Colonel Holden, there was Captain Cecil Parshall, uh, and there was also Major Eugene Taze. And uh, they had all discussed the possibility of, uh, of tunneling, of the possibility that prisoners may attempt to tunnel out of the prisoner of war camp. Um, Captain Parshall knew that there was a blind spot there. He knew the Germans would discover it. And he had tried, he attempted to warn uh, Major Taze and Colonel Holden about it. Um, Major Taze had come to the conclusion that it was a near impossibility because of the, the soil, the uh, hard compacted soil, the caliche. And anybody who's done gardening in, in the valley in Arizona knows uh, what caliche is like. And caliche is extremely hard, it's a concrete, uh, calcium carbide, carbide material that collects under the surface, it's almost impossible 
to, uh, to dig. You'll bend your shovel before you, before you get through it. Um, so it was determined that it was near impossible for them to, uh, for prisoners to, to dig out of their, of the uh, compound. So uh, the American administration of the camp really didn't, really wasn't watching for it. Uh, and this is, is I, this is difficult to even talk about because it's so ridiculous, but the prisoners of war approached uh, their administration and asked for gardening tools so that they could actually dig garden plots. Uh, they were given shovels and wheelbarrows and picks and things of that nature. Um, they were also uh, just, uh, asked for permission to make a, uh, a field, a sports field, to level a section of their compound to put in a sports field. They wanted to make a court uh, for uh, what the Germans call Faustball, um, which is the uh, basically the European equivalent of volleyball, and they wanted to they wanted to uh, they level off this this fill in depressions and level it off, and American administration said, yeah, that's fine, and what what ended up happening was all the spoil dirt from the tunnel, all the all the soil that the Germans were were digging out when they created their tunnel, uh, ended up leveling off the sports field. And so it was basically camouflage for all the spoiled earth. Eventually, uh, they dug a tunnel that was 178 feet long. And I'll go back to the previous slide. You can see from the, from the coal box, from this blind spot between the coal box and the bathhouse, it ran uh, underneath both fence lines uh, under a drainage ditch uh, and then to the bank of the Arizona Crosscut Canal. And that was where their, their exit was. Each man was responsible to, for making his own kit uh, to take with him. They divided in the, the, they decided they were gonna have 25, uh, I'm sorry, 28, initially it was 28 uh, prisoners of war that were going to escape. And they divided into two and three man teams. Each man was responsible for gathering his own uh, equipment, his own supplies, his food, they would, uh, they, they took military issue barracks bags like this one here and converted them into backpacks. They stole maps uh, from army vehicles. Prisoners of war were uh, forbidden from having maps, but they, they found maps in Arizona highways. They found them in the newspaper. They, they would steal them from army jeeps. Uh, this is an example of, of, uh, of a map of the period uh, that uh, was stolen. There was uh, a gentleman by the name of Wolfgang Claris, one of the prisoners involved in the escape. And he, he uh, looked at this map and he saw the, a blue line that ran from the New Mexico border all the way to the Colorado River, the Gila River, and saw how it passed close by the valley. And he thought it would be a really good idea. And he got two other prisoners to, to go in on the, on the scheme with him. He thought it'd be a really good idea to build a boat uh, to take with him a collapsible canoe that was made with canvas, excuse me, canvas and wood frame and sneak it out of the tunnel uh, on the night they decided to escape. Um, <clears throat> so uh, they were one of the three man teams and uh, at first the other prisoners made fun of them. They, they referred to them as the, the three crazy boatmen, but uh, Jürgen Wattenberg, the, uh, the senior officer, senior German officer, who was also uh, planning on escaping, he, uh, he gave him the go ahead and said, go ahead and try it. It doesn't seem any crazy or anything else. The, the plot was they wanted to escape and they wanted to make it down to Mexico. If they could make it into Latin America where there were German sympathizers, they, uh, they figured if they made it as far as South America, they were home free and they could get, they can get home the same way that Jürgen Wattenberg did in 1941. So they decided to escape on uh, near Christmas on December 23rd. The reason why is because they knew that there, that a lot of the soldiers guarding the camp would be sent home on leave. And uh, so there would be, uh, there would be a skeleton crew manning the guard towers. And uh, that was when they decided uh, to do that. This is third street in Jefferson, by the way, uh, right around the same time, Christmas of 1944. 
So uh, that's, that's when they decided to go ahead and, uh, and time their, their prison break. They wanted to do it on a Saturday. The reason why they wanted to do it on a Saturday was because the, the camp guards would, would perform roll calls twice a day. Uh, they would do it in the morning and in the afternoon, usually around uh, 4 p.m. was when they would do their second roll call. On Sundays, uh, they did not perform a roll call on Sunday morning. They only performed it once at 4 p.m. on uh, Sunday evening. They were, they were, and that, that turned into a big thing. There was, there was conflicting orders that were issued. A previous camp commander said that they didn't have to do roll calls on Sunday. The current camp commander said they did, but his orders got confused. It was, it was he issued contradictory orders. And so consequently, uh, the, there were no roll calls performed on a Sunday. The prisoners figured if they escaped on a Saturday night after roll call, they'd have almost 24 hours before they, their escape was discovered. And they were right. So right about the same time, uh, in late December of uh, 1944, uh, uh, the Germans launched uh, an offensive in the Ardennes forest in Belgium. And uh, what, what you probably know is the, the Battle of the Bulge. And initially, it was very successful. Uh, they uh, were able to push back uh, the American line several miles. And uh, it was a, uh, a, 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 it was a, a resounding success at first. Uh, on December 23rd, the prisoners in compound 1B, they basically started a big demonstration. They were singing, there was drinking of beer that they had stashed. They were, there, there was a, uh, a patriotic demonstrations. They were singing the German national anthem. It brought the American guards to compound 1B focused on what they, they figured that was going to be a riot. They ordered the Germans to, to, uh, to disperse Several of them refused. They had to uh, bring over weapons and uh, billy clubs and, and hand, uh, gas hand grenades, CS hand grenades, uh, and threatened to use them in order to get the Germans to disperse. While this was all going on, the prisoners in compound 1A escaped out the tunnel. It was a diversion that was, that was performed for their benefit. And it, ostensibly it was to celebrate uh, to celebrate the fact that uh, the Germans had uh, broken through in the Ardennes and they were, uh, they were riotous because of their, uh, their celebrating that the German army was on the offensive. And so that was, that was the cover for the actual escape. Uh, the prisoners escaped out of the tunnel, 25 of them, 20, there was supposed to be 28. Three of them ended up getting sick and decided to stay back. But 25 of them, uh, escaped uh, on the night of December 23rd, 1944. Went out the tunnel, they got into the Arizona Crosscut Canal and they, were, they waded uh, downstream and they started heading in their groups of twos and threes. They split up and started heading for Mexico. Six of them were rounded up on the first night. This is a, a teletype, a copy of a teletype uh, at the time from the, the Associated Press and it talks about um, the prison break and, and the fact that some of them were uh, some of them were rounded up in the, on the first night. You see a quote here from Colonel Holden. It says, "I've still not had complete reports on the break, and I hesitate to say exactly what happened." Uh, he and he, he they weren't even sure exactly when uh, the POWs actually went out the tunnel, but they went out the tunnel on uh, uh, on the evening of the of the twenty uh, third. They were not discovered until the next day at the 4 p.m. roll call that 25 prisoners of war were gone. Uh, that first night that they were out, uh, six of them were rounded up. I'm sorry, the next night, six of, six of them were rounded up. Uh, there, were, uh, there was a storm that was going on. It was uh, uh, heavy rain, uh, pretty cold. By that time they had been acclimated to the desert and uh, it was cold and rainy and there were some of them that turned themselves in, uh, uh, in and around Tempe, six of them because uh, they, were, they were cold and some of them had lost their food and uh, some of their supplies in the canal when they, when they waded down the canal and they had turned themselves in. Some of them tur uh, turned themselves into, uh, uh, a couple of them showed up at a house, knocked on the door and surrendered to a housewife. 
Um, some of them were, uh, uh, one of them was captured by a guard at, at an SRP facility. And so there were six that were rounded up on the first night, as I said. Uh, uh, kind of a, a sideline story here. There was a, a German uh, sub, uh, submarine commander by the name of Gunther Prien, who was a, uh, who had sank the battleship Royal Oak. And it was rumored that he was in Papago Park as a prisoner. Uh, he wasn't, he had been killed. Uh, he had been long dead uh, before Papago Park was even built. But um, there was a rumor going around in the press that he was held at Papago Park. Major Taze, the intelligence officer at Papago Park, was asked about this if he was one of the escapees, if Preen was one of the escapees. And, and uh, Eugene Taze commented, uh, uh, said no comment. That was his answer. No comment to a newspaper reporter was an affirmation. And it was printed, you can see here in the article, German subhero was held on the right hand side of the screen there. And uh, it turns out that was, that was total conjecture. That wasn't true at all. So there was a prisoner by the name of Helmut Guger, who uh, was one of the first ones recaptured. And uh, he was brought back to uh, Papago Park and he was uh, interrogated. And he basically sang like a canary. He told the Americans everything. He told them how many people uh, went out the tunnel, uh, he, who was in charge, who, who was in charge of the digging, who was in charge of rounding up materials, uh, who was in command. He told them about the three crazy bolt, boatmen. He told them where the tunnel was. And uh, the next day, uh, there was a corporal by the name of Lawrence Jorgensen, who was a guard there. And he discovered that uh, the exit to the tunnel on the Crosscut Canal. And here you can see, uh, there's the coal box. The coal box has been unloaded and, and pushed aside. And you can see the sandbags there. And that's, that's the tunnel opening that's uh, between the bathhouse and the coal box. This is a ladder that was fashioned by the, uh, by the Germans for going down to the, to the base. This is at the bottom of the tunnel. And the tunnel exit was uh, next to this telephone pole in this clump of bushes on the bank of the Arizona Crosscut Canal. Um, a remarkable uh, feat of engineering. They were able to, they used trigonometry to uh, determine um, exactly how far out they had to go in order to reach the, uh, the pole. They, they ended up doing measurements uh, using a, a, a triangle and they discovered that they needed to dig the tunnel 178 feet uh, to reach the, reach the power pole. The power pole was your target and they were spot on with their, with their calculations. So it was, uh, one of the American officers said it was a beautiful piece of engineering. There's a tunnel exit. Uh, uh, this is a uh, photographs that are taken by the army during the investigation. And, uh, the cover that the Germans had put over the, uh, over the tunnel exit was shoved aside and you can see the, they're photographing down into the, into the exit. Not all of them took off from Mexico. Uh, uh, Jürgen Wattenberg and uh, two, uh, two of his men from the U-162, uh, Walter Koser and Johann Kramer, they uh, actually, instead of going south, they headed north. Uh, at the time, uh, the Phoenix, what is now the Phoenix Mountain Preserve was outside of the city limits. And they headed north into the mountains around Mummy Mountain, Camelback, um, uh, Piesta was called today Piestawa Peak. And they actually found uh, a cave. It's probably better termed a rock shelter. There was a, an indentation the side of the, of, of, uh, the mountain there near, near Piestawa Peak. And that is where they, uh, they took shelter. Uh, they made frequent forays into, uh, down into Phoenix to, to gather water. And uh, they also had it set up. Uh, there was a uh, a maintenance yard that the army had near the park. And sometimes prisoners were brought in to work at the maintenance yard, maintenance yard for vehicles, I should say. And there was an abandoned derelict vehicle that was there, a car. And there were prisoners of war that would sneak food and cigarettes and, and, and supplies and store them in the car. And then Wattenberg would send one of his men, either Kozer or Kramer down into the valley to grab the supplies and bring them back to the rock shelters. The whole idea, was they're going to hide out and lay low in the mountains until, you know, the search was called off for them. 
the intense search was called off for them. And then they were going to try to make their way to Mexico. So uh, they actually, believe it or not, they, uh, on New Year's Eve, 1944, 1945, they, uh, they went to Lake Pleasant. They walked all the way to Lake Pleasant. They took a bath in the lake. They cooked uh, dinner and they just enjoyed, just rang in the new year uh, with a bottle of homemade schnapps on the, the hillside overlooking Lake Pleasant. They decided to, uh, to leave and to come back to, uh, to their rock shelter though, because one of, one of the men said it was duck season and we weren't, we weren't, uh, we didn't feel safe with all those guns around. So, uh, so they headed back to, to the rock shelter and that's where they, they, uh, they hung out. This is a, uh, a drawing that Jürgen Wattenberg uh, had in his papers that he, I'm not sure if he sketched this, he, his name is signed at the bottom or if he had somebody do it for him. Uh, I actually sent this to a German translator and she could not make out what, what this says. She said the handwriting was so uh, bad that she couldn't actually make out what it, what it said. But, uh, but you can see Jürgen Wattenberg's signature at the bottom there. And this was his impression of the rock shelter that they had uh, near Piestawa Peak. There was a huge manhunt, uh, one of the largest manhunts in American history. Uh, it involved uh, soldiers from the army. Uh, for, actually, there were, there were military personnel from all the branches of the military, but mostly from the army, from, from other camps besides Papago Park. Uh, from other military installations. The FBI was the leading agency in the manhunt. They had the statutory responsibility for uh, investigating and uh, searching for and apprehending POWs that, that escaped. Uh, municipal police departments, county sheriffs, uh, the Arizona Highway Patrol, Border Patrol, Customs Service, Railroad Police, Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, Civil Air Patrol. There were thousands of people that were looking for these, these gentlemen. Uh, there was a $25 reward for them if uh, you captured them and you brought them uh, back to the Army authorities. If, uh, say, you detained them and called the Army to come pick, him up, pick, pick them up, you got paid $15. So that was the reward for, for capturing them. $25 at that time was quite a bit. I mean, if you think about the fact that an Army private got paid 80 cents a day, 25 bucks was, was a lot of money at the time. Unfortunately for uh, Colonel Holden, he made, a, he made some comments to the press that really undermined his credibility even more than, than already had been. And he had said that, uh, he had said that the tunnel was dug through solid rock, that uh, they weren't expecting the prisoners to escape because uh, it was it was solid rock underneath the underneath the uh, underneath the camp and under underneath the soil of the camp and uh, they did not expect them to be able to to get out and uh, it was preposterous what he said I believe and and based on his testimony and some of the some of the investigations that occurred later I believe what he meant to say was he was trying to describe the hard caliche soil but he he called it rock uh, in the in the press and that didn't end up well for him. He, um, he was ridiculed uh, by, uh, by the newspapers, by editorials. There was a, uh, um, uh, the, the construction union that, that built, that, that, whose members built Papago Park, built the barracks there. They said they were very familiar, they, very familiar with the, uh, the soil uh, up in the valley and particularly around Papago Park. And they, they passed a resolution at one of their union meetings that said that that uh, Holden's uh, statement was quote unquote, fantastic and highly improbable. And uh, that came back to haunt Holden later on that was mentioned on the Senate floor by the American, uh, I'm sorry, by the, by the Arizona Senator when uh, he was calling for an investigation into the Army's handling of POWs. So it, it really did not, uh, did not end well for him. I'm gonna skip past this part here because we're, I need to, uh, in the interest of time. Um, so the local media just absolutely slammed. Uh, at, well, it wasn't just the local media, it was in the national media also, but the local media really, really uh, took them to task. Um, you can see these headlines or some, found, uh, some foundation for charges to be filed against the, the leadership of Pagolo Park. 
Um, you see the, at the bottom, this is taken from the Castle Ground Dispatch. The way I see it, it's really silly business, I'd say, when the commandant of the POW Papago Park in his initial announcement is not even sure on what day his jolly German submariners vamoosed. Uh, Walter Winchell got a hold of it and broadcast it all over, all over the nation across the world about uh, the fiasco at Papago Park. And so it was very, very embarrassing for the Army. So the prisoners that were uh, on their way down to Mexico, the three crazy boatmen, they got to the Gila River, and this is what they found. And uh, the comment was made by Wolfgang Karras, the stupid Americans, they put a blue line on the map when there isn't even water in the river. And so uh, they had to abandon their plan to float down the Gila River to the Colorado and thence to the, uh, to the Sea of Cortez. That was their plan for escaping. And so they had to abandon their boat and they ended up walking, not floating, walking down the Gila River. Uh, they got as far as Gila Bend, they didn't get very far, where, uh, where Frederick Uzzolino, uh, one of the prisoners was caught, literally caught with his pants down. He was uh, taking a bath in one of the irrigation canals and he got caught by a couple of cowboys who marched him back into Casa Grande. A posse came out, rounded up the two, uh, two other crazy boatmen and they were recaptured. Uh, after uh, 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 several days, um, they started getting they started getting rounded up. Uh, they none of them actually made it to Mexico. Uh, a couple of them were uh, were apprehended at a farmhouse in Stanfield. They surrendered in Stanfield after after one of them uh, stepped on a choya cactus and, and his foot got infected. They had to give themselves up, so they surrendered in Stanfield. Um, a couple other ones were captured uh, near the town of Sells. Uh, on the Tahana Odom uh, reservation, and they were captured by uh, Frederick Tully, who was a customs agent. Um, meanwhile, in Piesta Wapik, uh, eventually everybody was captured except for the three guys that head up, headed up into the mountains. And uh, Jürgen Wattenberg sent one of his men uh, to the drop point to gather supplies, and they just and there was a note that said that this drop point is compromised. We're going to make an, we're going to make another one on McDowell road for you. Uh, one of the, one of the prisoners went and tried to find the, 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 the drop point, the newly created drop point. He couldn't find it. Um, and so, uh, Johan Kramer actually decided to sneak back into the camp. He melt, he, he joined a German working party that was out, uh, harvesting crops and actually walked right back into Papago park undiscovered because they were counting them on the way out and they counted them on the way in. They had a guy extra that didn't bother them. If they were a guy short, that would have bothered them. But apparently the American guards, they weren't bothered by the fact that they had an extra prisoner. Um, he went back into, into the camp. Uh, he was recaptured in the camp. Once it was, there was some confusion with him and another prisoner's names that got, got all mixed up. Uh, they ended up sorting out who he was and he was recaptured. Uh, after a couple of days, uh, that was Johann Kromer, uh, Walter Koser, uh, another one of Jürgen Wattenberg's compatriots. He went, uh, to find the new drop point. He was recaptured by, uh, by soldiers. So after two days, Jürgen Wattenberg decided to, uh, go down into, he was the last one, last prisoner remaining. Um, and he decided to go down into the city of Phoenix. Uh, he, he had figured by the, uh, his guys didn't show back up at the cave. So he figured that they had been captured and he decided he was going to go down to Phoenix. He was going to, uh, try to get a room and, and spend the night and then possibly hop on a, on a freight train and get out of Dodge. So, uh, he headed down into, uh, the city of Phoenix. It was on a Saturday night and, uh, you got to remember, there were a lot of military installations. Uh, there was Luke Air Force Base, we Luke Army Airfield at the time, Williams Army Airfield. There was Falcon Field. There were the Thunderbird, both of the Thunderbird fields. There were a lot of military installations in the valley, and there was really only one place to go if you had a weekend pass, and that was downtown Phoenix. And so Jurgen Wattenberg headed into downtown Phoenix uh, on a Saturday night, but he was unable to find a room. There were too many soldiers that were there uh, on a weekend pass. And so uh, he ended up going to a Chinese food restaurant 
and having a, uh, having a nice meal and had a beer and then he headed back out onto the street. Um, eventually he made his way to the hotel Adams and, uh, the hotel Adams was full. Uh, but the desk clerk told him that, um, you know, you're welcome to crash here in the, in the lobby and you can sleep in a chair here. We'll have a room available in the morning. So Jürgen Wattenberg was very tired. He, uh, sat in the chair, fell asleep. He woke after midnight and he decided that, uh, he didn't, he decided he would be better off if he saved his money and just made his way to the train station, he could uh, try to, uh, in the darkness, he could tr get on board a, a freight car and get out of Phoenix. And so he left, he left the, uh, the Hotel Adams and he was uh, trying to head to Union Station. He ended up getting, getting turned around a little bit. Uh, he went up to Van Buren Street, went north up to Van Buren and uh, once he got onto Van Buren, he, uh, he approached a city of Phoenix street department uh, crew that was working, uh, re uh, performing repairs on the street. And he approached a gentleman by the name of uh, Clarence Cherry, who was the, uh, who was the foreman of the, of the crew. And uh, he asked, uh, can you tell me where Van Buren street is? And uh, Clarence Cherry said, you're standing on it. And then Jürgen Wattenberg asked him uh, for directions to the railway station. And uh, it, he, he did it in a very peculiar accent. Uh, he was unable to mask his accent, his German accent. And it, it, uh, it caught the attention of Mr. Cherry. Uh, Mr. Cherry gave him directions uh, to uh, the Union Station. And uh, uh, Captain Wattenberg turned and started heading that direction, said, uh, told him thank you and started heading that way. Uh, right about the same time, uh, Clarence Cherry looked down the street and there was uh, Sergeant uh, Brady from the Phoenix Police Department, Gordon Brady, uh, I'm sorry, Gilbert Brady, Sergeant Gilbert Brady from the uh, Phoenix Police Department was, he was a desk sergeant at uh, PD headquarters and he was heading out uh, on his lunch break and uh, he was stopped by Mr. Cherry and he said, that guy over there, uh, just asked me directions to the railway station. He has a really funny, he's suspicious, has a funny accent. So Sergeant Brady caught up with him right about here. Uh, this is a period photograph of Third Avenue and Van Buren. And that's the, right about the spot where uh, Sergeant Brady caught up with Jürgen Wattenberg. And he asked him, um, asked him for identification. Jürgen Wattenberg said, I'm sorry, I don't have any. And he said, why not? He says, well, I, I wasn't expecting to uh, stay in Phoenix. I didn't bring it with me. He made, he made some lame excuses. And he said, you don't have an alien registration card. He said, where, where are you from? And Jürgen Wattenberg said, uh, I'm from Glendale. And the sergeant said, Glendale, California, or Glendale, Arizona. And Jürgen Wattenberg told him, well, uh, Glendale back east. A Phoenix police car came by. Sergeant Brady flagged him down, opened the back door, told Jürgen Wattenberg get in. So they got in to take him down to Phoenix uh, headquarters, Phoenix police headquarters. And uh, when he did, uh, when he got in the back of the car, he, he said, I'm, he goes, I'm, I'm the, I'm the big shot you were looking for. The game is up and I've lost. So he admitted that he was a German POW. Here's the head, uh, the news headline from that. So uh, Several days later, um, they were marched into the, the prisoners that had all been recaptured, all 25 of them been recaptured. Uh, the, the stool pigeon, uh, Guger, he was actually shipped to a different camp, so he wouldn't suffer the same fate as young Werner Dreschler had several months earlier. Uh, but the rest of them were rounded up and they were, they were brought into a new uh, secure camp called Camp Pima. Uh, and they were, their punishment? was that they were put on bread and water for the same number of days that they had been out of the camp. That was it. Um, Colonel Holden, there, uh, however, there was an investigation, there were two investigations that were performed. One was, being, was performed by uh, the um, Army Service Forces, and one was performed by a board of officers uh, that was convened in the camp itself. Um, it didn't end well. Uh, 
the recommendation was made uh, that uh, Holden uh, and uh, Major Taze and several other officers uh, were to be court-martialed uh, for dereliction of duty. However, before that could happen, uh, Colonel Holden's uh, heart uh, act started acting up again. He had, remember I mentioned he had a cardiac condition and he started having chest pains. He was trans transported to the Army Hospital in Palm Springs. Um, subsequently, uh, he was never brought to trial. And because he was never brought to trial, the other officers involved were never brought to trial. And the Army had been under fire for being too easy on German prisoners. Uh, they were, they had to treat, and the Army's view is that the, the Geneva Convention was law. And they had to treat German prisoners decently because if they didn't, they were afraid that the Germans holding American prisoners would retaliate. And so uh, it was viewed by the press though that they were coddling German prisoners. They made it too easy on them. And uh, they, they, the army didn't want any more negative press about their POW camps, about their work programs. And so Holden's illness was an excuse, a convenient excuse to delay the court martial. Um, and subsequently the whole uh, uh, Papago Park affair was swept under the carpet. Um, Colonel Holden uh, actually passed away in 1949 at the age of 60. Uh, so yeah, he, he had a legitimate heart issue and uh, he died just, just four years later. The only disciplinary, uh, disciplinary action was uh, Holden had actually found uh, Major Tay's derelict of duty on his own and he had relieved him of his position. But uh, that is it. That is the story of Papago Park. <laughs>